The following episode contains a brief description of sexual violence and may not be suitable for everyone. Please be advised. Matt, I just wondered if we should make a bit of a clarification about this series for the listeners, because it could be a bit confusing. Yeah, it could be, but I think it's very straightforward. So this, as you know, is a podcast called British Scandal. We're covering in this series a story that was featured on a show called A Very English Scandal, not to be confused with a show called A Very British Scandal, which covered the Duke of Argyle, which this series isn't about, but that we might cover in a future series. Of British Scandal. Of British Scandal. But this series of British Scandal covers a story featured on A Very English Scandal about Jeremy Thorpe. Though not all the same beats as a very English scandal, because obviously this is British scandal and we deal with things differently. Exactly, it's completely different. A very English scandal is very different to British scandal, even though we're covering the same story in a different way. And we're not yet covering the story on a very British scandal on British scandal. I'm just so glad you cleared that up. Twenty third of October, nineteen seventy five, Coombe Martin, Barnstable. Norman Scott rushes from the Delves Hotel towards the waiting Ford Cortina. His Great Dane, Rinker, trots dutifully behind. As they get closer to the beaten up car, the large dog pulls back on his leash, scared. Norman tugs him gently. It's okay, Rinker. He's here to protect us. A young man stands on the driver's side, his tall frame looming over the bonnet. He wears a khaki coloured anorak over a black polo neck sweater. An expression of panic crosses his face. You can't bring that. I don't like dogs. I can't go without him. His angry expression remains, but he eventually motions for the pair to get into the back. Relieved, Norman directs Rinker in, then squashes up beside him. The man starts the car, and soon the lights of Barnstable dissolve, replaced by dark country lanes. Spots of rain hit the windows, making it harder still to see out. The last thing you need in a scene of dramatic tension is a Great Dane in a claustrophobic space. (laughs) (laughs) But Norman isn't scared. He's relieved. Yesterday, he had a tip-off that a hitman had been hired to kill him. This man, Peter Keane, is here to drive him to a safe house. Once there, Norman hopes he can finally put the nightmare of the last 15 years behind him. The rain lashes down harder, pelting the car windscreen. Norman looks into the rearview mirror, notes the fear in Keane's eyes. Are you okay? Can't see a bloody thing. Norman tries to look beyond the windscreen wipers, pick out a landmark, but from where he's sitting, it's impossible. I'll drive if you like. I I know these roads well. Keane's eyes move nervously towards Rinker, then back to Norman. All right. Keane gets out of the car and Norman does the same. Rinker jumps out after him. Within seconds, they're soaked through. It's pitch black now. The cold wind bites Norman's skin. He wipes the rainwater from his eyes, taking in the bleak surroundings. He realises they're by the moors. Uh, what are we doing here? I, I, I thought the safe house was in Porlock. He turns back to face a rain-drenched Keane. He's still standing by the driver's door, but now something seems off. Keane's expression is blank. Then, he lifts his arm to reveal a gun. Norman gasps at the sight of it. He feels the blood drain from his face as he realises what's going on. Keane wasn't sent to protect him from danger. He's the hitman. Rinker starts barking at Keane. Then there's a sudden flash, a gunshot, a guttural yelp. Rinker's body collapses on the wet ground. Norman falls to his knees. He cradles the dog in his arms, watching blood gush from a wound in his chest. He feels cold metal against the side of his head. Then Keane's voice. Your turn. All Norman can do is close his eyes and wait for Keane to pull the trigger. He feels a strange sense of inevitability. He always knew this was how it was going to end. That one day, Jeremy Thorpe would find a way to shut him up for good. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal, the show where we bring you stories from this green and not always so pleasant land. 
British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, some are about sex. They're all about power. But when we look at scandals a bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. So we're journeying back to ask who's to blame for what happened. And when the dust settled, did anything really change? So, Matt, we've had some big political scandals in our time on this show. Yeah, and coincidentally, since we started recording this, we have lived through and are still living through a period of incredible political scandal here in Britain. So are you talking about the ones that we've covered on the show or the ones that have happened while we've been recording? That's a good point. It has been a very rich time for hashtag content, hasn't it? Uh, Both really, but we've covered all the big ones. We've talked about Boris. We've done Profumo. We've had a bit of Stonehouse. Yes, and all of those involve politicians being caught with their trousers down. Yeah, literally, not even metaphorically. And why break with tradition? So today I've got a story for you that continues our theory that when you're looking at the British political system, sexual scandal is never too far away. This is a story that some will be very familiar with. Jeremy Thorpe, a Liberal MP who in the 70s was embroiled in the biggest political scandal of the decade. But the difference with the other political scandals that we've tackled is that at the heart of this story is a murder plot right at the centre of British politics. It's almost like a scandal on a scandal. That's a fantastic phrase. Yeah, even by the usual standards of incredible British political scandals, this one escalates in a way that none of the others do. You don't even know the half of it. This is episode one, Simply Heaven. Autumn 1959, Westminster, London. Jeremy Thorpe feels like an excited child as he waits for the Speaker of the House to call his name. At the age of 30, after two failed bids, he's finally Liberal MP for North Devon. To say he's outnumbered here is an understatement. Thorpe and his five Liberal colleagues are surrounded by 258 Labour members and 365 Conservatives. He watches the Tories cheer and wave their order papers as their leader, Harold Macmillan, talks about how he'll spend his second term as Prime Minister. But he doesn't feel intimidated. He feels like he's come home. When Thorpe's name is called, he almost jumps to his feet, raising eyebrows with his eye-catching attire as he does. Since his time at Oxford, he's been known for his flamboyant dress sense. Today, he's gone all out, in a smart brown suit with a brocade waistcoat and shiny buckled shoes. With his chiselled looks and confident manner, He pulls it off effortlessly. Mr Speaker, my right honourable friends, may I say what an honour it is to address you here today. I realise that with my rather colourful attire, some of you may see me as no more than a vulgar young show-off. I relish the chance to prove that I am in fact a serious and committed politician, as well as a vulgar young show-off. There are roars of laughter from all sides of the house, and Thorpe drinks it in. He never doubted that he belonged in Westminster. His late father was a Conservative MP, his grandfather too. When the session is finished, Liberal Party leader Joe Grimmond approaches and pats him on the back. Ah, the future of our party. Great show today, Jeremy. Pleased, Thorpe returns to his office to find his mother, Ursula, waiting. A monocle is pressed over one of her eyes, as always, making her stern face look even more displeased. He dutifully kisses her on the cheek. So have you come to offer your congratulations? She looks at him as if he's lost his mind. Whatever for? You're in a party that will never see real power again. The Liberals will always be a poor third, just like your underwhelming degree. Snobbery to one side? Lover. I always love a formidable unloving cold mother because we know in the end that is going to pay dividends in British scandal terms. Yes, if these parents loved their children, this podcast would not exist. (laughs) So true. Thorpe is stung. He knows his mother loves him dearly, but she never seems to tire of reminding him about his third class degree or how long it's been since there was a last Liberal Prime Minister. But despite his privileged background, Thorpe is serious about his political leanings. He's always felt an affinity with the underdog. Don't underestimate me, Mother. I have every intention of lifting this party from the doldrums to the glory it deserves. 
She shakes her head sadly before patting his cheek and wordlessly gliding out of the door. Thorpe pours himself a whiskey. He knocks it back, feeling the warmth of the alcohol spread inside him. I feel like not enough politicians do that these days. Just a good whiskey in the afternoon, and I think our politics would be vastly improved. Well, certainly Prime Minister's questions would be much more exciting. You know, they brought it forward to midday, partially to stop MPs being so drunk. I mean, this is in our lifetime. It used to be at three o'clock, twice a week, and they brought it to midday because the MPs were just in the bars from midday till three. They were sloshed. They treated it like it was an England game. They just had three hours of pre-drinks and then they'd go at the game. (gasps) I had no idea. Thorpe's determined to not let his mother rain on his parade and pours himself another. But an hour later, he still can't shake off her cutting words. He needs a release, something alcohol and approval from his peers can't provide. He drains his glass. 30 minutes later, he stands in a dark corner of Green Park. A man approaches and they exchange a knowing look. Thorpe is gripped by a familiar mixture of fear and excitement. Homosexuality is illegal in Britain. If this got out, it would kill his political career. He could even go to prison. But Thorpe is sure he can be careful enough for his two worlds to coexist. He has to be. No one can ever discover his secret. A year later, Kingham, Oxfordshire. Stepping out of his black sunbeam rapier, Thorpe places his brown bowler hat on his head and pulls his collar up around his neck to protect him from the evening chill. He's at the 17th century Cotswolds home of the Honourable Norman Van de Brett de Vater, or Van to his friends. Thorpe's been a casual friend of the horse rider for a few years and they have friends in common, some of whom are exceedingly wealthy. That's the main reason he's here. Things are going well for Thorpe. He's already amassed quite a following in the Commons. He's hoping tonight he can win more brownie points by securing some new party donors. He's about to head inside when a rider comes into view. The young man on the black stallion can't be more than 19 or 20 years old and has thick black hair, dark eyes and full lips. Taking him in, Thorpe is almost breathless. He flashes his brightest smile, and to his delight, the boy jumps off the horse and makes his way over. Thorpe removes his hat and smooths back his hair, gestures towards the horse. What an impressive beast. Beautiful, isn't he? I I shouldn't have favourites, but I enjoy riding him so much. Thorpe pats the stallion, trying to hide his distaste. I must ask Van if I can take him for a test drive myself. Do you compete too? Before Thorpe can fumble an answer, he hears laughter behind him. He turns to see Van striding towards them. Jeremy is many things, but a competent rider isn't one of them. Do leave our guest alone, Norman. Get back to the stables where you belong. Norman looks crestfallen and quickly turns his attention back to his horse. Thorpe sniffs. He hates the way Van treats his staff. As Norman leads the horse to the stables, Thorpe watches him. Was that really necessary? Van shrugs, turning to walk back to the house. With no choice but to follow his host, Thorpe can't resist a look back at the boy. He's simply heaven. An hour later, seated at Van's large dining table, Thorpe is doing his best to engage with the assembled guests. But he can't stop thinking about Norman. He must lean on Van for more information. You must show me the stables again, Van. I haven't been down there for such a long time. A playful smile flits across Van's face. Not like you to take an interest in my stallions, dear boy. Unless something else caught your eye. Thorpe flushes, watching as Van grins. He eyes the nearby diners, who are looking his way, clearly intrigued. Thorpe forces himself to remain calm. He needs to be more careful. Heading back to his car later, he sees a light shining from the nearby stables. Thorpe knows he should ignore it. He can't risk being seen with Norman alone after dinner. But he can't help himself. He finds Norman tossing fresh straw on the ground, sweaty from the hard work. Entranced, Thorpe clears his throat to get his attention. Norman looks up, surprised. Unsure of his next move, 
Thorpe reaches into his wallet and hands Norman one of his business cards. Norman looks from the card to Thorpe, impressed. You're an MP? I am. I take my job very seriously. Van can be a tricky character. If you ever have trouble with him, do get in touch. Thorpe walks away, a frisson of excitement coursing through him. He shouldn't have done that. But where's the harm? It was an innocent encounter, nothing more. Chances are he'll never see Norman again. April 1961, Kingham, Oxfordshire. Norman's heart sinks as he climbs the stairs to Van's lavish bathroom. Stepping inside, he finds his employer in the bath waiting. Norman dutifully walks over and picks up a razor. Then he covers Van's back in thick cream and begins to shave. The parallels between their working relationship and ours are frightening. I wouldn't be using a thick cream. Well, I'm the one doing the shaving. Matthew, the water's (laughs) getting cold. This is a far cry from what Norman thought the role of working student would entail. But Van insists he does it once a week. He doesn't dare argue. Growing up in a modest house in Kent, he'd never experienced anything like grandeur before working here. And Norman dreams of a career as a competitive rider. For a reference from someone of Van's standing, tasks like this seem a small price to pay. I'm going away for a few days. When I return, I expect everything to be in order. If it isn't, you'll be given your cards. Norman wants to bring up the fact he hasn't been paid for two months, but he thinks better of it. At least with Van gone, he'll be able to raid the generous larder. I can't believe he hasn't even been paid yet. I thought your head would be completely turned by the generous larder. Do you know what? It it kind of would be. But I haven't been paid. Oh, pickles! (laughs) Returning to his room, Norman takes out a bottle of antidepressants. He's needed them on and off since his mid-teens. An illegitimate child of a volatile single mother, he didn't have the easiest adolescence and has struggled with anxiety ever since. But spending time with animals seems to help. When he first rode a horse at 15, he found a calmness he'd never experienced before. Since then, all his closest friends have had four legs. One of them is his small dog, Mrs Tish, who he rescued from a shelter last year. She trots towards him now, jumps up and licks his face. Norman knocks back his required dose of pills and fusses over her. Hearing Van's car leave the driveway, he feels a huge surge of relief. Come on, Tish, let's find you some food. Norman heads straight to the kitchen. Glancing at the post on the counter, he's delighted to see a letter addressed to him. One of the excuses Van has given for Norman's lack of pay is that he needs a national insurance card to receive employment checks. Norman thinks it's finally arrived. But as he opens the envelope, he feels a rising sense of unease in the pit of his stomach. He scans the typed page, confusion mounting, as he reads a final demand for over £500 worth of riding equipment in his name. Norman's heart races. He doesn't understand. He didn't order any of this. His eyes flick anxiously to the table. The brown envelope underneath is also addressed to him. His hands tremble as he rips it open. It's another bill. This time, for a Land Rover, costing thousands. Norman feels sick. Van has been on a spending spree in his name. God knows how much he owes and to whom. Mrs Tish yapping at his heels, Norman races to Van's study and opens his writing bureau. He grabs all the folders of paperwork he can find, He doesn't know what they contain, but maybe something within will answer the questions racing through his head. Less than 15 minutes later, with nothing but a small bag over his shoulder and Mrs Tish under his arm, Norman runs down the gravel driveway. He has no idea where he's going. All he knows is he must get as far away from here as fast as he can. November 1961, Oxford. Norman sits alone in the small white room. 
The clock on the wall seems to tick more loudly by the second. He taps his foot anxiously on the floor. He's about to see his mother for the first time in just over five years. Norman has been in Ashurst Psychiatric Clinic for several months. After fleeing vans, he'd left Mrs Tish with a neighbour and started sleeping rough. One night, he'd taken too many of his anti-anxiety pills and overdosed. He's made good progress since, but thoughts of his impending discharge have caused a downward spiral. He hasn't got many options, but he knows he can't go back to sleeping on the streets. One of his psychiatrists suggested Norman invite his mother to visit. Norman was hesitant to see her. After all, they were barely speaking by the time he left home at 16. But she's all he has left. He hears a shuffle at the door. He sits up straight, eyes alert. His mother enters the room. She wears the same cold expression and carries the same air of disdain he remembers from his childhood. Norman tries to disguise his disappointment by launching into nervous chat. How, how are you, mother? Was the journey OK? It was fine. Phil drove me. Norman tenses at the mention of his stepfather. Watching her shuffle uncomfortably in her seat, he forces himself to get to the point. The, the, the doctors here think I'm ready to be discharged, but I need somewhere to go. I, I, I was sleeping rough before, you see. Norman expects his mother to at least flinch at that revelation, but her expression stays blank. Norman thinks he even detects mild irritation. Are you sure they said you're ready? Or is this another one of your moments where you make things up? You were always prone to flights of fancy. Norman feels like he's shrinking, but he swallows his pride. She's his only hope. I promise you, I I'm different now. You can ask my doctors yourself. She studies her hands, clearly uncomfortable looking Norman in the eye. We're in a smaller house now. It simply wouldn't be practical. This place seems very nice. I'm sure they'd have you for longer. Norman feels a lump in his throat. When he speaks, he can hear how feeble, how desperate he sounds. Mother, please. I, 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 I have nowhere else to go. Norman tries reaching out to hold his mother's hand. She snatches it away, recoiling from him. He realises there's no point in arguing. His mother simply doesn't want him. When his mother is gone, his doctor enters. Norman shakes his head. The doctor looks sympathetic and turns to his notes, reading through for a few moments. When you first arrived, you mentioned an MP friend. Could you stay with him for a little while? Norman realises he's referring to Jeremy Thorpe. In the folders he took from Van's house, Norman had discovered letters and cards to Van from the MP, written on Commons notepaper. In the immediate aftermath of his overdose, Norman would fantasise the letters were addressed to him. He'd found the MP's manner so kind, so beguiling. He'd been flattered that this esteemed member of society had taken an interest in someone like him. After a while, Norman began to believe they really were friends. In his heavily medicated state, he must have told his doctors the same. It hadn't even crossed Norman's mind to try and contact Thorpe until now. He thinks back to when they met and Thorpe's invitation to get in touch. When his doctor tells him the hospital can cover his train fare to London, his mind is made up. He'll pick up Mrs Tish, head straight for Westminster and hope that Jeremy Thorpe is a man of his word. November 1961, Westminster. Jeremy Thorpe strides around the Liberal leader's office as if it's his own. Grimmond might be the boss, but Thorpe's the one commanding all the attention. He's just announced yet another large contribution to party funds, the direct result of a contact he's been nurturing. Well done, Jeremy. We might have to start thinking about a more prominent position for you. Can't have you flying under the radar. Come now, Joe. When have I ever done that? Back in his office, Thorpe looks at the clock. It's 5.45pm. Just as he resigns himself to having another evening burning the midnight oil, his phone rings. It's the security desk. Mr Thorpe, there's a young man here to see you. He 
He says his name is Norman Joseph. Thorpe searches his mind, hesitates. Says he's a friend of Mr. Van der Weyser. The delicious stable boy? What on earth is he doing here? But his puzzlement is soon replaced by a rush of excitement. Still holding the phone, Thorpe quickly checks his reflection in the small mirror on his office wall. Um, yes, uh, one of my constituents. Send him up. I can't do that, Mr Thorpe. He has a dog with him. No dogs are permitted in the building. I'll come down. Five minutes later, Thorpe approaches Norman in the lobby. He's sitting on a dark green leather bench, just by the corridor leading to the House of Lords, with a small dog on his lap. He looks every bit as gorgeous as Thorpe remembers. His slightly dishevelled appearance only adds to his brooding aura. Thorpe extends his arms, as if greeting an old friend. Norman! How marvellous to see you again! Norman stands and throws him a shy smile. Thorpe's heart flutters. He sees a vulnerability in this boy he hadn't noticed on their first meeting. It only makes him even more attractive. He sits down beside Norman, pats the dog on the head. Tell me, Norman, what brings you here? Norman starts talking at Thorpe, 19 to the dozen. Thorpe struggles to take in everything he's saying, but the gist of it seems to be that his relationship with Van has turned sour, that he's had a stint in a clinic, and he's in need of a new job and a home. As Norman talks, a group of guided tourists file past. A couple of lords walk down the corridor towards them. Thorpe notes their eyes on him. For the first time, Thorpe feels anxious. These are hardly matters he can discuss in the commons lobby. Thorpe looks towards the exit. Would it really be so bad if he took Norman for a drink nearby? But as one of his Westminster colleagues passes by, he realises he can't risk it. His London lodgings aren't an option either. Far too many MPs have their own pied de terres near his. Then Thorpe has an idea. I was just finishing for the day. Would you care to join me for supper? Norman looks surprised. Uh, really? Even with Mrs Tish? Thorpe grins and nods his head. He knows exactly where to take Norman. That evening, 8th of November, 1961. Oxted, Surrey. Thorpe looks on as Norman silently dips a buttered soldier into the soft-boiled egg in front of him. It's a typical Ursula Thorpe supper. As his mother lops the top off her own shell, she watches her guest like a hawk. Thorpe notes she's barely taken her eyes off him since they arrived at her austere Victorian house an hour ago. Thorpe decided the best thing he could do was take Norman away from London for the night, somewhere safe where they wouldn't be disturbed. His mother's home seemed perfect, but now he's having second thoughts. As a cover story, he told his mother that Norman is a photographer booked to accompany him on his business trip to Malta in the morning. But Norman looks so nervous that Thorpe is scared he will blow the whole charade at any moment. He practically holds his breath as his mother places her spoon by her egg cup and turns to her guest, eyes narrowing. Tell me... What will you do with the dog while you're in Malta? Norman looks lost for words. Thorpe glances at Mrs Tish, who's sitting by his master's feet. He'd forgotten all about her. Ah, uh, didn't you say kennels? Norman quickly nods. To Thorpe's great relief, his mother goes back to her egg. After finishing, she sits back and lights a cigar, puffs out a few perfectly formed smoke rings. I'll make up the spare room before I retire. Thorpe can hardly wait. Thank you, Mother. I'm sure Norman's just as keen to get to bed as I am. A little later, Thorpe shows Norman into the guest room, where he presents him with a pair of freshly pressed pyjamas and a copy of the novel Giovanni's Room. He tries to sound casual as he hands it over. It's about a love affair between two men. Norman simply nods, seemingly unshocked. It's the response Thorpe had hoped for. But still unsure of his next move, he heads to his own room next door. Thorpe gets changed into his pyjamas and waits for the sound of Ursula's bedroom door to close. When it does, his heart begins to thud in his chest. Surely he's not 
going to make a move at his mum's house. It happens, Matt. I don't want to shock you, but it happens. Mum's hearing is unlike anything on the planet. The slightest creak in the kitchen and they're straight down there. Thorpe isn't usually nervous about making a move on another man, but tonight is different. He can't be certain of Norman's feelings for him. Should he just go to sleep, forget about Norman in that way? He tries to close his eyes, but he's not the slightest bit tired. It's now or never. Thorpe enters Norman's room and sits at the end of the bed. Norman pulls the sheet up to his chin, looking scared. Oh dear, you look just like a frightened rabbit. Thorpe is sure all Norman needs is reassurance. He moves under the blankets, draws him in for a hug and starts stroking his skin to comfort him. There, there, poor bunny. To Thorpe's shock, Norman begins to sob. It only turns him on more. He holds Norman tighter, putting his finger over Norman's mouth, then pointing to the wall, indicating his mother is in the next room. Thorpe knows Norman could call out, alert her at any moment. He imagines her shock and disgust if she walked in and caught them. But somehow, it adds to the buzz. Remember, bunnies, no noise. Lying in his own bed, Thorpe can't sleep. Norman could be everything he's wanted for the last few years. No more seeking out strangers. No more risk of exposure. But better than that, he'd finally have real companionship. Someone to go to at the end of a long day, who he could be his real self with. They would both be getting something out of it. In the morning, he's going to find Norman a place in London, look after him. For the first time, Thorpe is convinced he can have the political and private life he's always craved. It doesn't really feel like Norman's welfare or needs are considered by Thorpe at all. He's certainly a self-concerned man who wants all of the things he's just described. He's trying to fix a problem which is sort of his loneliness and his need for intimacy But Norman's very complex situation certainly isn't part of that consideration. Now, there's already a power dynamic of a member of parliament from a particular background, a young man with mental health issues and nowhere to stay. But once Norman is visibly upset and is crying, to not even read that and to not stop what he was doing there feels very sinister. December 1961, German Street, London. Norman barely recognises himself as he studies his reflection in the long mirror. He's in Thorpe's favourite tailor's shop, being fitted for a smart velvet two-piece. His eyes widen as he turns over the price tag. He could never afford this. Beside him, Thorpe grins, then turns to the tailor. We'll take two. But you've bought me so much already. Thorpe pats his shoulder reassuringly, whispers in his ear. Nothing's too much for my bunnies. Norman bristles. Bunnies has been Thorpe's nickname for him since that first night. He's still not comfortable with the sexual aspect of their relationship. He was shell-shocked after their initial encounter, which he hadn't expected or wanted. He'd never thought of himself as homosexual. In truth, he hates sex with Thorpe. The only reason he didn't cry out at him that first night was the fear of alerting his mother. He couldn't have coped with the shame. But in the past month, Thorpe has transformed his life. He now has a bedsit in Chelsea, a whole new wardrobe and a very comfortable existence. Mrs Tish even feeds on gourmet dog food. He feels cared for and loved. The sex feels like a small price to pay. So cold when you hear it like that, just how completely transactional it is. Yeah, and this is a theme that we've seen a lot of times in other series of British Scandal. Often people who have these really troubling pasts, they've had lots of things to overcome, they sort of fall into the orbit of very powerful people. And so those patterns get repeated, you know, that damage just gets compounded. Their shopping trip is followed by lunch at the exclusive Reform Club in St James's, where they bump into some of Thorpe's Westminster colleagues. As always, Thorpe introduces Norman as a friend of his cousin. 
Then they go back to Norman's place and have sex. Afterwards, Thorpe readies himself to leave immediately. Do you have to go? I'm afraid I have another trip abroad, but I'll see you in a couple of weeks when I'm back. Norman feels crushed. He gets lonely and bored when Thorpe's away. He misses riding, the countryside, even the structure of the working day. Eyeing Thorpe's copy of The Times, Norman reaches over and flicks to the classifieds. Maybe I should start working again. I think that's a marvellous idea. Norman brightens at the prospect. As soon as Thorpe has gone, he puts on his new suit and takes himself off to the local employment agency, where he asks about jobs with horses. He's delighted to be told of several opportunities, including a vacancy with a dressage trainer in France. That must be the poshest job centre in the UK. Do you have any jobs with horses? Oh, yes, there's a few dressage opportunities in France. (laughs) But Van still has his national insurance card. By the time he's retrieved it and applied for a passport, the job will be gone. He calls Thorpe and shares his concerns. Don't you worry. I can put myself down as your employer. Sort out all the paperwork. Leave it with me. The following morning, Norman is further brightened when a letter arrives from Thorpe. He often writes when he's about to go away and can't meet in person. Norman loves receiving these missives, always written on Commons notepaper. This one, like the others, is full of affection, saying, don't you worry, bunnies can and will go to France. Thorpe goes on to add that he'll miss Norman while he's away. Norman is filled with a new sense of security and purpose. Despite the drawbacks of a relationship with Jeremy Thorpe, he's determined to make it work and build a new life for himself. March 1962, Westminster. Thorpe struts into the Commons lobby, where he's immediately accosted by a reporter from ITN. Mr Thorpe, word is that Joe Grimmond could retire as party leader by the end of the year and you're in the mix as successor. Will you be putting yourself forward as party leader? Thorpe chuckles. I don't know where you heard such scurrilous rumours, but they're news to me. My thoughts couldn't be further away from such matters. Thorpe can't resist giving the reporter a cheeky smile and wink before he walks away. He won't say it for fear of ruffling feathers, but of course he's heard the rumours. Party members are increasingly concerned that Grimmon's getting too old for the job. Thorpe's biding his time, and when the right moment comes, he'll pounce. He's still grinning as he enters his office and picks up the ringing phone. At first, he can't make out any words, just whimpering. Then he realises it's Norman. It's, it's Mrs Tish. She, she's had to be put down. I, I feel like it's all my fault. Thorpe tries to calm Norman down, but it's no use. His words turn back into anguished sobs. These kinds of calls have become all too regular lately, and Thorpe is finding Norman's bouts of anxiety increasingly tedious. But he also feels responsible. Norman's mental health went into decline after the French job fell through. Thorpe had forgotten to chase up Norman's paperwork in time, as promised. Now he's forced to listen as Norman accuses him of being cold and cruel, keeping him shut away like a dirty secret, having everything on his terms. A colleague raps on Thorpe's office door and reminds him they're due at the Liberal Club for a meeting. Norman's voice continues to whine down the phone, making it impossible for Thorpe to concentrate. He waits for the colleague to go, then hisses into the receiver. That is enough, Norman. I simply cannot deal with you when you're like this. Be a man and pull yourself together. Thorpe slams the phone down. He instantly feels bad. Bunnies didn't deserve that, not after such a terrible shock. He grabs his notepaper, starts scribbling a contrite letter. But he knows that's not enough this time. He must apologise in person. Later that afternoon, he pulls up outside Norman's flat. He's alarmed to see an ambulance parked outside, lights flashing. Without thinking, he gets out of the car and begins to head over when he sees an unconscious Norman being stretched out. Oh, my God. Then he hears one of the paramedics using the word overdose. He pushes the paramedics apart to reach the side of the stretcher. They look at him, alarmed. Sir, do you know this man? 
Thorpe stops dead in his tracks. He looks up to see the circle of paramedics looking at him, as well as a few curious residents who have come out of their houses. He can't be recognised. It'll raise too many questions. He straightens up, puts on a charming smile. Uh, no, I don't. Sorry for disturbing you. He pulls his hat low over his eyes, scurries back to his car and speeds back to Westminster. On his way, his shock slowly makes way to a building anger. Not at Norman, but at himself. He's a damn fool for thinking he could have it all. He hopes that Norman will pull through, but he resolves that if he does, he will finish their relationship. He doesn't want to, but he can't risk getting in any deeper with someone so unstable. With power within his grasp, he simply has too much to lose. He only prays it's not too late to come out of this unscathed. Eighteen months later, October 1964, North Devon. Jeremy Thorpe stands on the platform at the packed assembly hall, fully aware of the TV cameras trained on his face. He straightens his mauve suede jacket and smiles his brightest smile. It's the night of the general election and Thorpe is predicted to do well. But as the result is announced, it exceeded even his expectations. He's increased his majority by over 5,000. It's a 15-fold rise. The night only gets better when he hears how the other parties have done. Labour has won overall, but only by four seats. Meanwhile, the Tory leader, Edward Heath, has failed to set the political world on fire. The Liberal Party is ideally placed to pick up unhappy voters on both sides. Thorpe is celebrating at a drinks party with local constituents when he's told Joe Grimmond is on the phone. Congratulations, Jeremy. Get yourself to Westminster first thing. We have much to discuss. The next morning in Grimmond's office, Thorpe receives a hero's welcome from senior members of the party, including the leader. This is the strongest we've been since the Asquith days. And credit where it's due, Thorpe. That's in no small part due to your tireless fundraising and campaigning. Thorpe feels the excitement rise in his chest. His whole career has been building to this moment. Grimmond beams at him. How would you feel about becoming the party's official spokesman on Commonwealth Affairs? What? He might as well have offered him... Recycling? It's just such a non-job. But official spokesman of recycling. Oh, you've talked me into it again. Thorpe's smile falters. His body feels like it's deflating by the second. But he feels the room watching him, so he plasters on a smile. I would be honoured, Joe. Thank you. He can't help but feel disappointed. He'd hoped Grimmond might finally be ready to step aside once the selection was done but he's stubbornly hanging on. Thorpe stalks back to his office, cursing his optimism. And to add insult to injury, he finds his mother waiting for him, stern-faced as ever. Mother, now isn't a great time. She holds a hand up, silencing him in an instant. I need you to be quiet and listen to what I have to say. When your father died, watching your enthusiasm for politics was painful, and then, to make matters worse, you broke a long line of proud Conservative MPs to join a party with no future and no real purchase in the Commons. Thorpe grits his teeth. Mother, I've had a terrible day. I don't need more. But then he's cut off again. He sighs but watches confused as his mother's expression changes. He could swear she looks embarrassed. It's not often I'm proved wrong, and God knows it's taken me time to admit that I may have got it wrong on this occasion. This is very rare in British scandal. Matriarchs and patriarchs very rarely admit to the other person's face that they were wrong. They much prefer a double down and then a triple down. Thorpe allows a grin to grow from the corner of his mouth as he listens to his mother labour over her words. Jeremy, you've proved yourself to be every bit as good an MP as your father was. I know he would be very proud of you. 
his mother stops suddenly. It's clear she's finding it difficult to go on. Thorpe approaches her, clasping her hand. Her eyes glisten with tears. He's never seen her like this. And I may have even been wrong about the fortunes of your chosen party. A delighted laugh escapes Thorpe's lips. She pats his hand. So, how can we ensure you reach number ten? Thorpe can't believe it. He never thought the day would come when his mother endorsed him as a liberal, let alone believed he could lead the party to power. He takes out his best bottle of scotch and pours them both a glass. To number ten. Knocking back his drink, Thorpe thinks there's only one more thing that can make the last 24 hours complete. Sex. Typical politician. He decides he'll go to his regular spot in the park later. It's times like this he feels a pang of regret for letting Norman go. But he banishes those thoughts as he thinks about his next stop. Leader of the Liberal Party. October 1964, Dublin. Exiting St James's Hospital, Norman struggles to hold his crutches and the medication he's been prescribed. He's just finished a month-long stay after crushing six vertebrae in his spine whilst competing in the Royal Dublin Horse Show. Horse riding is dangerous. I've never done it myself, partly for this reason. What are the other reasons you haven't done it? My background, access to stables... (laughs) My background. I'm from a family of horse haters. (laughs) It's the latest in a long list of disasters for Norman. He was devastated when Thorpe ended their relationship, but believed him when he promised he would stay in touch and help him find a job once he was well enough. At first, he stuck to his word, even arranging for Norman to work with a vet in Switzerland. But that ended abruptly when Thorpe once again failed to sort out the paperwork he needed. Since then, his former lover has been a ghost. Phone calls are never picked up. Letters go unanswered. Thorpe has well and truly abandoned him. Now, with nowhere to go and nothing to look forward to, all he can think to do is head to the nearest bar. There, he knocks back one gin after another. Penny for him. Norman turns to see a man has sat down beside him. He begins to chat away, finding his mood lifting. A few drinks later, they've struck up a real rapport. When Norman stands woozy with alcohol, he struggles to steady himself on his crutches. Let me help you. Norman feels so grateful as the man helps him outside. He's still confused about his sexuality, but tonight he has no doubt that a warm body beside him is what he needs. He lunges at his kindly companion, attempting to kiss him. Get away from me, you dirty bastard. I'm not one of them. Without the man's support, Norman falls to the ground. Pain shoots through his spine and he writhes in agony. The man spits on him and runs off. I just feel so sorry for Norman, even in smaller situations where he just needs a bit of friendship. It's so hard for him. And you realise the risk that you're running, even when you think that you've made that kind of romantic or sexual connection, that actually the worst case scenario isn't rejection, but is genuine danger. Sobering up in a nearby cafe with a mug of tea, Norman hears yesterday's UK general election being discussed on the radio. He listens intently as the conversation moves to how well the Liberals have done, especially one Jeremy Thorpe. His body shakes as a realisation takes hold. This is all his fault. None of the help he promised has materialised. Norman's forever punishing himself, But Thorpe is the real villain. Norman gets back on his crutches and slowly hobbles to the nearest police station. He's exhausted by the time he gets there, but he fights through the pain to reach the front desk. The duty sergeant looks at him quizzically. Norman takes the love letters Thorpe wrote him from his coat pocket, places them on the desk. I've had a homosexual affair with Liberal MP Jeremy Thorpe. And I want to make a statement. (laughs) 
This is the first episode in our series, The Murderous MP. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatisations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read A Very English Scandal by John Preston, An Accidental Icon by Norman Scott, Rinkgate, The Rise and Fall of Jeremy Thorpe by Barry Penrose, and In My Own Time by Jeremy Thorpe. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Wendy Granditer wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Rich Evans. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gelardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Theodora Leloudis, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louis for Wondery.